begin the session. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Matt Gray. I am the uh, Senior Associate Director of Operations at Wharton AI for Business. And I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's technical workshop entitled The Art and Science of A-B Testing for Business Decisions, brought to you by the Wharton AI for Business Research Center. Today's session will be led by PhD candidate Alex Miller from the Department of Operations, Information and Decisions at the Wharton School. This session will be from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. The session will be interactive, so please submit any questions that you have via the chat function for the workshop leader to answer. Our leader will answer your questions throughout the session. Now, allow me to turn the session over to Alex. Alex? Great, thank you, Matt. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. I'm I'm uh, excited that you're spending the next couple hours with me. I hope we uh, I'm able to um, cover some interesting and useful material material for you guys um, around the topic of A/B testing and how to get the most out of uh, business experiments. Um, so I should say uh, uh, a lot of the both the research and the kind of the the simulation tool that we're going to be using has been sponsored by. Uh, Warden AI for Business and Analytics at Warden. So I'm very grateful for them for supporting my research. Um, and as I get into the uh, the session here, I just want to uh, encourage everybody to uh, on the Zoom uh, interface. If you go and, and see in the participants tab, you can edit your name. If you wouldn't mind just editing your name to you know your first name or, or whatever name you want to be called. Um, and then in parentheses have your location and uh, your affiliation or company uh, if, if you want people to know that. So for example, I'm gonna uh, hit rename for myself, type Alex. Uh, I'm actually in Salt Lake City right now and I'm at Wharton. So if you look at my name in the chat, it should, be, should, should say that. So if you do that, that I think will just help me uh, uh, call on people by name and also uh, get a sense for where everybody's at. Okay, so um, just a, a quick introduction to myself, uh, why, why I'm here, why I'm giving this session. So I'm, uh, as Matt mentioned, I'm a PhD student in my final year at the Wharton School in the Department of Operations, Information and Decisions. Uh, this summer, I'll be starting as an assistant professor of quantitative marketing at the USC Marshall School of Business. And my entire dissertation project um, has revolved around A-B testing. And I, I have a lot of uh, research projects surrounded the, the application of A-B testing in e-commerce and online personalization, uh, as well as algorithmic decision-making. And I've, I've had prior experiment, experience where I've uh, started an A-B testing service for a digital marketing agency, and I've worked as a data scientist um, and a data engineer, as well as done some web analytics consulting. So just to give you a very broad overview of um, kind of the, the main sections that I'm hoping to cover throughout this session, uh, at the very beginning, I'm going to cover some core concepts, and the, and the purpose of this section is just to get everybody on the same page in terms of understanding the key terms I'm going to be using, make sure we understand what an A-B test is, uh, how it works kind of at a, at a semi-granular level, um, uh, make sure you're familiar with the terminology that you might encounter uh, if you get into uh, uh, start A-B testing within your company. Um, and then the, the second section is, I think, kind of the, the meat and potatoes of, of the talk, which is where I'm going to talk about um, kind of moving beyond just the bare bones of, you know, how to use an A-B test, what an A-B test is, and, and help you to think about how you can use A-B testing to kind of solve the right problem and use the right paradigm for thinking about incorporating A-B testing into your uh, decision-making frameworks. And then in the, the second half, so I'm, I'm thinking that might take us to the, the first hour. Um, and in the second half of this uh, seminar, I'm going to be doing an, a simulation exercise where um, I'm going to have you guys uh, interact with an application, a, a web application that I've helped been developing over the course of the past year, which is designed to kind of give you some hands-on experience, experience um, to get what it feels like to run an A-B test, as well as to incorporate some of the concepts that I'm going to be covering um, in, in the earlier um, sections. So, and then at the end, I'm just going to debrief and, and uh, we'll kind of conclude from there. So um, just to describe what I'm hoping that you guys will get out of this workshop. So again, the, the first thing is just a hands-on understanding of what A-B testing is, what types of problems it can help you solve, what it looks like to, to run and, and um, 
analyze an, uh, an experiment uh, for the purposes of uh, business decision making. Um, and that's kind of the, the basics. And then the, the really my, my main hope is that what you guys take away from this is a high level understanding of how to use A-B testing tools to make sure you're solving the right problems um, in your business, right? And, and um, I'm gonna try and avoid using math and I'm gonna try and avoid covering topics which are covered in other uh, resources that you can find online. There's a lot of A-B testing uh, companies out there and they have a lot of good resources about you know, the, the exact mathematics underlying how to calculate statistics. Um, and, um, you know, so some of kind of the, the, the biggest pitfalls to avoid when, when running experiments, I'm going to try and avoid things which are covered elsewhere and kind of give you some of the things that I've been thinking a lot in, in, about with my research um, and, and hopefully kind of give you some information that you're not going to find elsewhere. Okay, so to get into uh, the core concepts of A-B testing, and, and also just as I, as I begin here, please feel free to interrupt, whether that's uh, raising your hand in the, the Zoom window or sending a chat. Um, send the chat to everybody so everybody can see, and, and, and in case I don't see the chat, I'm going to ask um, Maddie or Matt, who's, who's helping run the workshop, uh, interrupt me and, and make sure I'm seeing all of your questions if, if they come in. Okay, so just to make sure we're all on the same page and, and I don't get too far without defining what an A-B test is, um, A-B test, A -B testing is the practice of using randomized experiments for making business decisions. And, and the reason it's called A-B testing uh, just comes from kind of this idea that uh, there's a lot of situations where you might have two, uh, uh, two strategies which you're hoping to implement, a strategy A and strategy B, you're not sure which one is going to work, and so you're going to run uh, an experiment to decide which one um, is going to uh, be the best strategy moving forward, right? And, and, and A-B testing can absolutely involve more than just two arms, right? So it's sometimes called like A-B-N testing if you have more than two arms or A-B-C testing. But the, the terminology A-B testing is just a shorthand for saying using experiments to evaluate different decisions that you can make as, as a, a manager. Um, one thing that A-B testing is not, you'll, you might hear this kind of colloquially, colloquially thrown around in, in marketing speak or, or uh, management speak. Um, A-B testing is not just trying multiple things in an ad hoc way and, and, and seeing what works, right? So, so uh, you might hear people say like, oh, let's just A-B test that. When, what, they, what they mean is we'll do both things and see what happens. If you don't have the randomization piece, um, and, and, and you're not actually running a controlled experiment, then that's not uh, an A-B test uh, in, in the way that I'm going to be using the term. And, and we're going to, I'm going to explain, you know, why randomization is, is so important uh, for running a true A-B test. Okay, so why should we care about A-B testing in the first place? It's a very reasonable question to ask. Um, and I'm hopefully going to uh, be able to explain um, in in, in reasonable terms why, why this is a, a powerful decision-making framework. So really the, the A-B testing and, and randomized experiments are what's commonly referred to as the gold standard for measuring cause and effect, right? So anytime when you're trying to measure and quantify the, out, the, uh, the effects that your actions have on a set of outcomes that you care about, randomization is a very powerful tool for helping you predict uh, which of those strategies is going to be optimal, right? So it, it's, a, it's a very um, rigorous and, and, and principled way of evaluating two things and, and, and can be considered essentially, you know, the, the best possible way of evaluating two alternative strategies. Um, secondly, A-B testing can, if you develop a practice of A-B testing, it can help you understand which components of your products and services actually drive value. Right, so if you experiment with many different aspects of your of your website uh, or your service, uh, and, and you compare, you know how manipulating one aspect of your website affects your your profits compared to another aspect of your website, uh, it, it allows you to really quantify and, and develop an intuitive sense for which aspects of your business are actually having a large the largest impact on driving the outcomes that you care about. And the last piece, which uh, is a really 
critical piece, and I'm not, I'm not going to spend a ton of time uh, belaboring this in this talk. I'll give you some references for, for um, uh, reading more about this aspect of uh, experimentation. But if you develop a habit of using experiments in your uh, for a, as a decision making tool, this can facilitate a culture of empirical measurement and organizational learning, right? And and I, I, one quote that I think ca captures this very well is from Isaac Asimov. It goes, experimentation is the least arrogant method of gaining knowledge, right? Um, and, and this gets at the fact that if you're going to run an experiment, it requires you to admit and say, you know, I don't know which of these strategies is actually the best. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is that that's the, the, the case for most things we do in, in business. Um, and when, when, you know, it's very easy, uh, depending on your organizational structure or your team dynamics or your social dynamics, um, you know, it's very easy for, for some people's opinions to start mattering more than others um, and for there to not be uh, uh, a culture of actually learning from raw data and learning from actually trying things. And using experimentation on a regular basis is a very powerful tool for just keeping everybody humble in terms of um, uh, admitting that they don't know, um, they don't always know the right answer. And, and also, if you think you know the right answer and you run an experiment and, and it comes up the exact opposite of what you had predicted, it inculcates a sense of humility when it comes to um, how your your organization makes decisions. So I think it's, it's a really important component of uh, uh, A-B testing as a, a, as a discipline. Um, now, you might think that A-B testing is, is kind of, uh, you know, only for super sophisticated organizations with very fancy analytical uh, uh, and technical tools. And this has historically been the case, right? So uh, 20 years ago, uh, big tech companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, they had the technical know-how and engineering tools to actually run experiments at scale, measure them with precision. And so they've over time developed an intensely uh, experimental culture in their organizations. And these companies are well known for running, you know, thousands of experiments a year um, and acting, using those experiments to drive business decisions. But the fact of the matter is that, that nowadays, A-B testing really is for everybody. So there's a number of software companies that have emerged in the past 10 years or so that have opened up the possibility of running rigorous randomized experiments to even very small companies or uh, even small non-technical teams at large companies, right? So uh, almost every web analytics platform and mobile analytics platform has the capability of running experiments, you know, whether it's uh, you use Adobe, HubSpot, Optimizely is a tool which is specifically designed to help you run experiments on your website. Uh, and Google Analytics has this tool called Google Optimize where you can essentially, uh, you know, at, at small scales, you can run experiments completely for free. Um, so, so there's really no reason uh, at a technical level why you shouldn't uh, be able to run experiments um, within your team at your company. Uh, and just to give a couple of references, I'm not going to be able to cover everything that I think is important, but uh, just a couple of references that, I, you know, if, if you get very excited about this topic and you want to learn more and, and kind of internalize some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, there's these two books. One is called Experimentation Works. It's by uh, uh, Stefan Tomke, by, who, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School. Um, this really kind of gives you a, a, a really well-rounded understanding of why you should run experiments, what that can do for your organizational culture. Um, and, and it dives much deeper into that aspect, you know, less of the technical side and more of the, you know, why should you even care about experiments and what can it do for you at, at, at the big picture level. Um, and there's also this uh, excellent book by uh, some folks at, uh, who are at Microsoft and LinkedIn called Trustworthy Online Controlled Experiments. It's a little bit more technical, but again, it, it's, uh, it, as you get into A-B testing, um, this is an excellent resource for avoiding some, some important uh, pitfalls uh, when it comes to implementing an A-B testing strategy. And also gives you some good advice for uh, at, at, at the technical and engineering level of how to run experiments. 
Okay, so uh, getting to the basics of business experimentation. Why do we run randomized experiments in the first place? Right? Why, why is randomization such, such an important tool? And, and, and essentially it comes down to the fact that randomization has been developed as a technique, which is specifically designed as a means of causal inference. And causal inference just means the process of understanding and measuring cause and effect. And if you step back and think about a lot of what you, the decisions you make as a manager or a marketer, um, many of your decisions at the end of the day are kind of causal inference problems in disguise, right? Any, any problem that has the flavor of, if I take action X, that will cause result Y, um, and trying to actually measure the effect of, of your actions on the outcomes is a causal inference problem. Not all problems are causal inference problems, but um, uh, many, many problems when it comes to um, uh, business decisions really come down to really wanting, they're much easier to make good decisions if you can actually understand and measure how your actions affect your firm's outcomes. And again, this, this uh, harkens back to classical phrase, you know, correlation is not causation. But to kind of walk through an example of, of uh, what this might look like uh, in the context of A-B testing, right? So that, imagine you redesigned your homepage, um, your, your website, your company's homepage. There's two ways of, of looking at um, uh, that redesign process, right? So one way... It, you could say we redesigned our homepage last week and customer conversions increased, right? So that's one way of, of describing uh, how that change affected your business outcomes. Another way, the better way, what we would like to know and be able to state with confidence is that customer conversions increased last week because we redesigned our homepage, right? The first statement merely states the fact that two things happened to occur at the same time, right? The homepage was redesigned conversions increased. The second statement is able to say specifically the fact that the, the reason, the cause of the increase in customer conversions was the homepage redesign, right? So, so in general, it's very hard to distinguish between these two things, um, but with uh, experimentation, you, you can get at that, the, ca the causal statement in the second point. And so, so why is it so hard to distinguish between these two things? It's just useful to think about um, you know, at a high level, why, what randomization is doing for us uh, in the first place, right? And, and really it comes down to the fact that it's hard to separate out the actions that uh, you can take, you know, the, the factors that you can control. It's hard to distinguish those factors from other factors that might be driving your customer's behavior, right? So, you know, it's likely that your homepage design affects your customer's behavior, right? That's, that's certainly probably one aspect of the, the, what determines whether or not your customers are going to be making a purchase on your website. However, there's many other factors. I've listed just a small subset of possible factors here, but there's, there's a, you know, probably innumerable number of factors which actually causally affect what your customers are doing in every, any given moment, right? So uh, it could be the day of the week that your customers are visiting uh, your website or, or the day of the month, right? If, if they got paid, uh, on Friday and they visit your website on Saturday, that's completely out of your control, but that probably has a significant effect on whether or not that person is gonna make a purchase uh, on, on that day. It could be the weather outside the customer's window. It could be the marketing campaigns that other teams in your organization are running, right? The types of customers that they're driving to your website. And it could be the type of strategies that your competitors are, are running, right? So these are all the factors that almost certainly affect what your customers do, uh, which you have no control over, and which can confound what we're actually trying to measure uh, when we're trying to uh, understand the effect of uh, the homepage redesign. Um, uh, and it can, it's essentially very hard to disentangle, uh, you know, without randomization, it's very hard to disentangle any change in customer behavior. It's, a, it's hard to attribute that to one of these things versus all of these other things. So, so randomization can help us here by essentially isolating the effect of the homepage redesign in this case, right? So the idea is that 
uh, if you randomly assign half of your customers to see the, the one version of the homepage and you assign the other half of your customers to see the other version of your homepage, on average, all of the other kind of confounding factors that might be affecting customers' behavior is going to be equal between those two groups. Um, right, so, so that the purpose of randomization is to make sure that, that uh, the only thing that really varies systematically between the, the two groups in your experiment is the thing that is under your control, is the thing that you're trying to measure the effect of, in this case, the homepage redesign. And all of the other factors, even though we can't control them explicitly, um, with a large enough data set, within, with, with a, a large enough sample size, those factors should statistically uh, average out and be equal between the customers who saw version A and the customers who saw version B. All right, so that's kind of a high level what randomization uh, is doing for us. And I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding this uh, talk is not going to contain any formulas. So, so you know, there, there's obviously ways of formalizing all of this using statistics, but I think this kind of gives you uh, at, a, at a high level and intuitive level understanding kind of what randomization is doing for us in the first place. Okay, so, so with that out of the way, it's, it's useful to describe where A-B testing can be most useful um, for you as a manager, right? So, so really it comes down to any situation where you have multiple strategies or actions that you're thinking about implementing. Um, and then three factors are kind of essential for being able to use an experiment to evaluate those strategies. So the first is that you don't know which of these strategies is going to be the best. And, and really it comes down more that you're not, that you're willing to admit that you don't know which strategy is best. Um, and you're willing to uh, spend the time and effort to gather data and figure out um, uh, in, 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 and let the data determine which of these strategies uh, you should use moving forward. The second condition is that you can implement this, these strategies using some sort of randomization. Um, and the third factor is that you can measure the, res the, the outcomes uh, for each of the, the uh, experimental groups in your uh, experiment. You need to be able to measure the, the metrics that you care about uh, that's gonna, that are gonna help you determine which of the strategies you should be using, All right? So these are kind of all key components of, um, uh, that are required mm -hmm. to run a successful A-B test. And, and it's useful to think about, um, you know, A-B testing specifically in the context of digital business, right, relative to kind of traditional forms of commerce, right? So in the digital world, kind of all of these factors that I mentioned, <clears throat> specifically the, the randomization and the measurement factors are much, much easier in the world of digital business, right? So the first is that the, the cost of kind of coming up with new strategies or new innovations in your product or your services is much lower in the digital world than the offline world, right? Uh, if you're a pure e-commerce company, it's much cheaper to redesign your homepage than it would be for a brick and mortar uh, retail company to kind of redesign their entire floor layout, right? So the cost of coming up with innovations is much lower in the digital world. Similarly, it's much easier to randomize uh, customers to each of the, the versions of your service that you're trying to implement uh, in the digital world, right? It's, it's almost essentially impossible to randomize uh, your store layout uh, in the physical world. For every customer that walks in, you can't randomly rearrange your store uh, based off of every customer that walks in. But in the online world, you can give a different version of your website to every single customer that, that comes to your website, right? So randomization is much easier. And lastly, measurement is much easier. It's much easier to attribute and measure what customers are doing, when they're doing it, um, and, and attribute their actions to the, the situations in which the, 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 the strategies to which the customers were exposed to, right? And so I, I don't mean to say that A-B testing is not uh, valuable in offline contexts. It can definitely be valuable. Uh, but there's a reason why A-B testing has kind of exploded in the past 10 or 20 years, uh, which is that, you know, given the, the kind of rapid uh, uh, rise of e-commerce and uh, information technology, 
these, all of these factors have kind of culminated and made it much easier to run experiments in the online world than has traditionally been possible. Okay, so just to kind of put some meat on the bones of, of kind of what an experiment is or what you might, what some companies are, are testing, um, I'm just gonna go over a few quick examples. Um, so the first is, here's an example of a experiment that was run at uh, Verizon where they're just uh, trying to measure the effect of the design of their product pricing or their, their plan pricing uh, on customer conversion rates, right? So you have this version on top, which is kind of uh, the original version. And then they came up with this alternative version on bottom. Um, and this was an experiment where, where you know, you might have an inkling of, of which one is going to result in higher conversions. Um, but but uh, again, the, the way to rigorously determine how which of these versions is going to result in the highest customer conversion rates is to run an experiment between them. Similarly, if, if uh, you're an e-commerce company or you're a retail company, uh, this is an example from Express where they, you know, they have a landing page and, and they're, you can think of many different things you could advertise at the top of your landing page. In this case, they have a, a promotional deal, kind of just a generic marketing message at the top in, in one version. And in the, in the second version, they're specifically directing customers to the different subcategories of clothing. Um, another example from the nonprofit sector would be this uh, form where kind of the main manipulation being tested here is the effect of uh, having these preset donation, donation amounts and seeing whether that increases uh, the, the, the uh, amount of donations coming into the, the charity, right? So the, the point is not to say that these are stereotypical or... or these are things that you should be testing. That's, that's not the point I'm trying to make. It's, it's more just, uh, really the point I'm trying to make is that the, the space of things you can test is very, very large. And what you should test in your organization is gonna depend critically on your industry and your context. Um, and so it, it's hard for me to sit, give generalizable advice about things that you should be testing, um, what, what experiments in your context should look like. There are a lot of online resources, especially when it comes to e-commerce and SaaS uh, websites where kind of designers and experimentation companies have collated a lot of uh, principles and user experience uh, uh, paradigms that might be serve as useful inspiration if, if you're coming up dry and, and don't have uh, ideas for things you should be experimenting on. But I will say that you should be aware of, uh, you know, you shouldn't assume that something that worked at some set of companies or, you know, somebody on the internet is going to work at your company, right? And that's where uh, really the, the power of experimentation comes in is that you should feel empowered to go out and test, you know, if somebody get some, some guru, some marketing guru says, oh, the key to driving conversions is to do, you know, have a blue button on your, your checkout page. Um, you don't have to just take their word for it. You can use that as inspiration and say, okay, that's an interesting hypothesis. Let's see if that works at our company. Um, and it may or may not work. And, and, and the point is that if you develop a culture of experimentation and you run a lot of ex experiments over time, you will build up a muscle of kind of, a, and an intuition of understanding which of the factors on your website uh, are gonna be most useful for driving the outcomes that you're gonna be caring about. So I'm, I'm not gonna be, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be covering too much of this, which is describing exactly what you should test. I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on techniques and principles for testing. Um, but, but you know, deciding what to test is, is a critical component of uh, the A-B testing uh, experience. Okay, so taking a step back, we've kind of covered definitions. What is an A-B test? What might it look like at some companies? Um, I'm just going to cover... Uh, at a, at a you know higher level, the key steps required when it comes to running an effective A/B test. Um, and the first uh, I kind of already mentioned is to develop a set of hypotheses that you are interested in testing. Right. In other words, for uh, uh, hypotheses that are frequently thrown around in, in this space are variations, treatments, arms, strategies. These all refer to the same things, and they're just when I, when I use any of these terms, I'm just talking about different things 
uh, different different uh, strategies that that you are thinking about implementing in your business. And and you know, as a concrete example, think about different versions of your website, different designs of some page of your website. Um, is, is a very common paradigm when it comes to thinking about uh, what an A-B test hypothesis might be. The second step is to define your evaluation criteria, right? So, you, so before you start an experiment, it's important to define the thing that you're going to be evaluating the results of the experiment on. Um, and it's important to do this beforehand because, uh, you know, it's easy once the data comes in to kind of cherry pick all, all of the, the metrics and say, oh, I... This is the metric I care about because uh, it's actually it's clearly performing the best. Um, a principled way of running an experiment is make sure you define your evaluation criteria before the experiment starts. Let the experiment let the experiment run, gather the data, and then make sure you evaluate the experiment against that criteria that you set beforehand. Uh, a third. Uh, step when it comes to running an, an experiment is to define your intended sample size or your stopping criteria or, you know, to determine how long you're going to run the experiment, more or less. And this is something which I'm actually going to be revisiting in, in kind of the second half of this talk. So I'm just going to assume for now that the, the length of an experiment is kind of taken for granted or it's given. Um, and the fourth step is to run the experiment, right? So this consists of randomly assigning customers to treatment arms. And the last step is to evaluate results depending on the criteria defined earlier. And to uh, essentially the goal of almost every A-B test is to implement and, and implement the, the strategy that performed best according to your criteria uh, moving forward, right? And so I'm gonna walk through a quick example here of, of kind of this, all of these processes um, to give you a, a little bit stronger sense of, of what I'm referring to here. So suppose you're, you're a UX designer at Nike, you're looking at the, your product page and you think you have a new idea for how the product page should work, which is gonna drive customer conversions, right? And I have here uh, uh, a little animation where, which demonstrates essentially how easy it is using modern testing tools to make edits to your website without really any technical experience, right? So you don't have to be a developer to run uh, experiments using modern testing software. This is uh, me using Google Optimize. I plug in the Nike's URL. It brings up the product page. I can essentially just click and edit each of the elements on the page and kind of come up with different variations of the website. So it's very easy to do this uh, for for marketing and, and non-technical folk. <clears throat> um, okay, so so the the first step that I mentioned earlier was coming up with a set of hypotheses. Uh, suppose these were the two versions of the product page that we were hoping to experiment with, right? So on the left hand side we have uh, version A, which has an orange button. On the right hand side I have version B, which has a green button. That's kind of the main manipulation that I'm going to be experimenting with and, and seeing how that affects. Uh, customer outcomes. Now, remember that the next two factors, the next two steps were defining the key evaluation criterion. Um, in this case, I'm going to uh, define the conversion rate as the thing that I'm most interested in improving or measuring. Um, and, and by conversion rate, I just mean the percentage of customers that make a purchase uh, after visiting your website. And again, I'm gonna come back to kind of other ways of deciding how long to run an experiment uh, in, in the second half. But let's just assume that we wanted to run ex this experiment for one week. Um, and that gets us through the first three steps of the testing process. Okay, so the fourth step is to actually run the experiment. And just to describe at a, a granular level, uh, you know, how that happens in, in, in the real world. While an experiment is running on your website, you can imagine uh, a customer or a user using their computer to make a request to your company's web server, your website. And the testing software that you're using, this could be something that you've developed internally or one of these third-party testing tools, uh, which are able to do this quite efficiently and, and cheaply. Um, the testing software is going to take the two treatments that you're intending to test and randomly determine uh, which of these treatments to show this particular customer. 
right? So the customer is going to see one of these two treatments. Uh, at the end of the customer session, the your testing software is going to be is going to record what the uh, record the user's behavior. In this case, the kind of the primary thing we care about is whether that customer's session ended in a purchase or not. And uh, essentially, all modern testing software provides a, a standardized way of reporting those results back to you as the experimenter. Okay. Um, so this is kind of what's going on under the scene, uh, behind the scenes when I'm talking about, you know, running an, an experiment on your website. This is kind of the, uh, the nitty gritty of what's happening. And to come to the, the final step of the experimentation process uh, is to evaluate the results of an A-B test. And this is a pretty standard dashboard. Uh, what it, in a lot of testing interfaces, this is what your standing, standard dashboard will look like. Uh, you'll be shown a table. Rows in this table will correspond to the different uh, versions of the uh, the website you were testing. In this case, version A, version B, um, the orange button and the green button, and a number of columns corresponding to the outcomes that you're measuring. All right. So in the you have the the number of sessions, so the number of users that were allocated to each of the two treatment arms. In this case, we have about ten thousand uh, customers in our total sample size, so about five thousand in each uh, arm. We measure the number of conversions that happened at, uh, at the end of all of those customer sessions. We can calculate the conversion rate, which is just the conversions uh, divided by the total number of sessions. And kind of the key outcome metric in, in, in any A-B test uh, interface is going to be what's called the effect size, or it's often called the lift um, over uh, the baseline, right? So in this case, if we consider uh, the A variant as our baseline, we're going to be comparing the B variant to the A variant. Uh, relative to uh, the A arm, the B arm had a, a uh, conversion rate, which is you know, about one percentage point lower than the, um, than the, the uh, A version. Uh, so I see a question where, where uh, Jillian mentioned that I also, um, in, in my example, I also mentioned, manipulated the font size of the price. You, you can experiment with multiple things at the same time. Um, it does make for, you know, it, it, it does make it more complicated when it comes to analyzing the results of your experiments. You can't say for sure whether, if you manipulate multiple things at the same time, you can't say for sure whether the change in conversion rate was caused by one or the other thing. Um, so that's something, you know, you need to, if you really care about isolating a single aspect of your website, you should test that separately, All right? So you might want to test the font size and the colors uh, in separate experiments. Uh, okay, so coming back to the results here, uh, you have the effect size, which is kind of the key metric, which in this case, uh, the effect size is between uh, version B is, is negative relative to version A, has a lower conversion rate. Um, and also, the, the, almost every testing interface is going to report some form of statistical confidence. In this case, I'm reporting the p-value. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about how to interpret this uh, in, in coming slides. But, but uh, it, you'll often see the uh, p-value, which is a, a form of statistical uh, quantifying statistical confidence. You might also see this reported as what's called the quote-unquote confidence where uh, it's fairly common for a, a testing dashboard to take the p-value, take one minus the p-value and report that as a percentage, right? So in this case, a p-value of 0 0.02 would correspond to a confidence of 98%. And I'm, I'm very careful to put confidence in, in quotation marks as for reasons you'll see in a bit. Um, I, I definitely, I don't like using the word confidence to describe this term. So just be careful when you come across this term uh, in the real world, in the real world. But, but uh, I'm going to be focusing on, you know, these kind of classical standard uh, uh, statistical uh, quantities because this is what's kind of emerged as standard practice in um, a lot of A-B testing software. So things are changing, right? So, so you should be, if you're going to use a testing dashboard, um, it's not always going to report just this p-value. Um, but, but in, in many situations, this is kind of the, the statistics that are going on behind the scenes. Okay, so, so why do we even need statistics in the first place, right? So 
The, the main reason is that these statistics provide a principled way of quantifying how certain you should be about your results, depending on the magnitude of the effect that you observed and your sample size, right? So in general, the more, the larger sample size, the more data you have, the more confident you can be um, in your, uh, in, in, in the fact, in, in, in the magnitude of the effect that you've observed in your experiment. And, you know, there's, there's statistics that kind of combine these two factors um, and convert it into a, a probability under a certain set of assumptions. And I, I don't think, it's not worth getting into exactly how those are, are computed, uh, but, but the, the main thing of, of, to take away is that both of these factors are going to affect how confident you should be in your results, right? So uh, more data, you should be more confident. And what statistics does for us is it provides us a way of quantifying the relationship between these two things. One challenge uh, is that statistics can be very difficult to interpret, uh, especially these types of classical p-value type statistics, right? So what everybody wishes that their software would just tell them straightforwardly is what is the probability that version A is better than version B or vice versa, right? So that's what we care about as decision makers. Um, this is, you know, essentially when you're, when you're running an experiment, this is the thing that you would, as a human being, like to know. Unfortunately, the way that cl statistics, classical statistics based off of p-values or what's called frequentist statistics, it's, uh, are unable to answer this question, okay? So I'm gonna d read the question that a p-value is answering, um, which is that a p-value answers, assuming there were no difference between versions A and B, what is the chance you would observe a result as or more extreme than the result you observed in your experiment, right? And if you think this is incredibly confusing, unintuitive, um, completely useless, you're not wrong. And I am gonna suggest that you should, uh, uh, you should demand that, you know, when people are reporting your, your statistics to you, you should make sure that they try and, and um, report them back to you in, in ways that a human being can understand, right? So uh, it's just the way that, because causal inference is a fundamentally hard problem, like, you know, predicting the future and, and measuring things uh, with precision is, is quite hard. Uh, statistics has to take this very circuitous route to quantifying uncertainty. And this can be a useful quantity to measure. Um, but I think for most people, you're not, you know, you're not, uh, statistically illiterate or, you know, deficient in any way, if you think this is not intuitive, because the fact of the matter is it's very much not intuitive. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, is kind of give you some basic rules of thumb for thinking about your p-values. Um, I have a question from Matt in New Jersey. Yeah, hi, uh, hi, Alex. Yeah, this is question came in the chat. I just wanna make sure you saw it. Uh, the question was under oh. the hood, this are conversion one. rates being compared as means or as proportions? Right. So in, in this case, um, uh, I'm using, well, a proportion is a mean in some sense. It's a mean of a, of a binary outcome. Uh, but as for a short answer, I'll just say that I, in this case, I was comparing the proportions uh, of conversion rates between A and B. Okay, so, so back to... Um, p-values for human beings, right? So, so um, uh, it's a very common rule of thumb in a lot of software. And uh, historically, this rule of thumb has emerged from kind of classical statistics, um, which is that if you observe a p-value smaller than 0 0.05, you can call that result, quote unquote, statistically significant. But I, I, if you think that is like some magical number, like you're not wrong in being skeptical of that threshold, um, which is, and it's because there is nothing magical about the p-value of 0 0.05. A p-value of 0 0.04 does not contain dramatically more evidence than a p-value of 0 0.06, right? Um, and uh, I am going to encourage you actually to feel liberated to move away from this kind of binary thinking of how kind of classical statistics has been designed um, and, and to, I want to empower you to kind of interpret these statistics in ways that actually make sense and are more intuitive for you as a human being, right? And, and the way I'm going to do this is to break up the 
interval of p-values into these um, humanly interpretable terms, right? So if you observe a p-value lower than 0 0.001, I say that you can interpret that result as being fairly confident that there's a, a meaningful difference between the two versions in your experiment. Similarly, p-value between 0 0.001 and 0 0.01 uh, you can think of as being a likely, there's likely a, a difference between the variations in your experiment. P-value between 0 0.01 and 0 0.05 is suggestive. And p-values larger than 0 0.05, I think, constitute very little evidence that there's really a meaningful difference between your two variations. And, and the reason I feel comfortable giving you these rules of thumbs is because I've conducted some research where I've analyzed a large number of experiments and done uh, what's called a Bayesian analysis, where I can take the p-values that are commonly reported and I can convert them into the, the quantities that we actually care about as human beings, right? So remember the quantity we wanna know is, what's the probability that there's a true difference between uh, variation A and variation B, right? And, and, and in my data set, <clears throat> um, a p-value of 0 0.05 only corresponds to a 42% probability that there's a true difference between your two uh, variations, right? And this is why you have to be very conf uh, careful when you use terms like confidence, right? So there's a lot of, most A-B testing software is gonna report the P a p-value of 0 0.05 as 95% confident. Um, and I'm gonna encourage you to be very skeptical of that terminology and to demand, you know, if, if you really want 95% confidence, if you want confidence at that high of a level, you're going to need to demand your p-values be much smaller, like closer to the order of 0 0.001. Right now, now I say uh, these are very rough rules of thumb. And, you know, these kind of probabilities that I'm reporting in red are based off of e-commerce data, a, a very large e-commerce data set, but, you know, not your data. Um, and so you shouldn't read too much into the exact probabilities I'm reporting here, but I think in general, this broad grouping of uh, interpretations of, of your p-values is probably a good rule of thumb for a lot of people in a lot of situations. So, um, okay. So just, just to kind of, kind of conclude, close the loop on the, the uh, experiment that we were looking at before, in this case, the p-value is 0 0.02. And so I think it's useful to, it's uh, possible to say it's quite likely that the uh, variant A, the orange button has a higher conversion rate than the green uh, variant, right? And so in this case, kind of the outcome- Alex, the I'm sorry to interrupt making, you. It looks like we have a, a question over here from a rose okay. a hand on the iPhone here. Go for it, iPhone. Are you there? I feel like quite... you are unmuted if you'd like to speak. Okay, well, perhaps we'll come back to that. Um, okay, so uh, this is kind of the, the basics of, of, you know, the nitty gritty, running an experiment, what it looks like how to interpret p-values in, in a human way. Um, I've given you some rules of thumb for thinking about p-values and, and quantifying uh, confidence when it comes to using standard statistical software. Um, and now what I wanna get into is uh, thinking a little bit bigger picture about how to use experiments um, more generally. And hopefully I'm gonna give you a framework for making decisions which kind of relies less on p-values um, uh, and more on kind of a, the risk profile of the experiments that you're running. So this is a good place to pause if there are any questions about, about things that I've uh, covered so far. It's okay if there aren't, but, it, but if you do, this is a, a good pause. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Another way of thinking about this, this problem is, is kind of the importance of understanding and defining fundamentally what the goal of your A-B test is. 
could you discuss how I approach priors in a Bayesian design? This is the question from the iPhone. Um, I am happy to discuss that offline. Um, uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a little much for me to get into the exact design of that research. I'm actually happy to share that that, that research is unpublished right now, but, but uh, if you send me an email, I, I, I can kind of elaborate a little more on that. Um, okay, so, so in the real world, fundamentally, the, the, uh, there, there's a, a fundamental trade-off when it comes to measuring things with statistics, right? So ideally, we would love to have very precise estimates at very small samples. Um, <clears throat> uh, but in the real world, that's just not possible. So in the real world, there's a trade-off between the more data you gather, you're going to have higher precision, right? So if you have larger sample sizes in your experiments, you're going to have more precision. Whereas if you have smaller sample sizes, you're going to be able to make decisions more quickly, right? So there's this fundamental tension when it comes to um, measuring things with statistics. And I think it's useful to think about the goals of an experiment as kind of falling on either side of the, the these two extremes. Um, so on the left-hand side, uh, the precision paradigm I think about is kind of the hypothesis testing paradigm. And the other paradigm is what I'm calling the metric optimization paradigm. Okay, and, and just to kind of say a little bit more about these, in the hypothesis testing paradigm, uh, it's a situation where you're coming to the table with a set of hypotheses, and your primary concern is to learn fundamentally uh, uh, kind of and quantify the difference between how these two strategies affect your outcome of interest. Right, and it's, it's very important in this paradigm to measure that difference with precision. And it's very important that when you make a decision, you're making the, the correct decision between A and B. Um, and, and you can think of an example, kind of canonical example where this is a, a good paradigm to adopt is something like you know, uh, clinical trials or vaccine testing, right? Where it's, it's very important that we get, uh, we, we if, if a vaccine is effective, we, we detect that effect with precision and we quantify how effective it is. Um, but if we were to get that decision wrong, right? If we, were, if we were to conclude that a vaccine is effective when it's in reality not, there's big external costs, right? There's reputational costs. Um, there's things outside of the mere um, efficacy of the vaccine, which are gonna be costly. So, so when there's these external costs, um, when precision is very important, you're, you can think of yourself as being in, in a hypothesis testing paradigm. On the other hand, uh, in the metric optimization paradigm, the really the primary goal is to maximize a particular metric that you're interested in. So for example, conversion rate or profits or revenues over a fixed period of time, right? So that's your principal number one goal, right? You would like to have precision, it would be nice, but your main goal is to maximize profits. And in this situation, you care less about making uh, the exact right decision 100% of the time you care less about knowing exactly why or how things work um, because really fundamentally the, the, the number one priority is that you're maximizing profits over time. And the way you can think about this uh, paradigm is like, imagine you have some fixed period of time where you're trying to maximize your profits. What you can do is you can run an experiment for some portion of that time. And then depending on which experiment uh, is, has the best performing uh, conversion rate, you would deploy that experiment or that, that treatment uh, to, to all of your customers for the remaining period of time uh, that, that you're considering, right? And kind of the decision problem here is, you know, how much of this time period should you allocate to gathering experimental data and how much should you allocate to deploying the optimal treatment arm uh, to the customers that are, are left in, in the period of time that you're interested in optimizing over? Right, so, so um, really the, 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 the key insight here is that the goal is, is the fact that even customers in, uh, that are not being experimented on, uh, there's value in concluding your experiment early because you can deploy the optimal arm for a longer period of time, right? So more people can see the higher performing arm. Um, and so there is, there's essentially a cost to running an experiment for too long um, in this metric optimization paradigm. 
All right, so, so which paradigm is correct, right? So ni neither of these is you know, canonically correct in all cases. Both have valid use cases, and they're not even necessarily mutually exclusive, but these are useful ways of, of thinking about how to use experiments in, in your application. So um, in the real world, I, I think there's a couple of things which make me uh, encourage people to adopt the optimization mindset a little more. So one is that sample sizes needed for very precise experiments are much larger than a lot of people realize, right? So if you truly want 95 or 99% confidence um, in, in the real sense where you're 99% sure that this thing is, is the decision you're making is correct, you need a lot of data, you know, oftentimes on the order of a million observations in your experiment to get that type of precision, right? And, and uh, kind of based on what I was just saying, there's, there, in a lot of cases, there's fundamentally a cost to running an experiment for a very long time, which is that you could have, you could be, while you're running that experiment, you could be giving some users who are receiving the suboptimal arm, you, they could have seen the optimal arm and, and re, uh, had a higher conversion rate resulting in more profits for you, right? So, so in my experience, the optimization paradigm matches more closely a lot of the scenarios that I think about people uh, using A-B testing for in the real world. <clears throat> so um, one thing I'll say is, is, is uh, it's useful to, get, to develop a little bit of intuition about sample sizes and, and just how much data you need to get uh, uh, precision at, at the kind of the levels that, that are kind of commonly assumed. I encourage you to visit this, uh, the sample size calculator and kind of play around with what your standard conversion rate is at your website and to play around with the effect size and see how that affects the kind of minimum sample size required to uh, obtain you know, classical levels of precision. Um, and I think that this will give you a little bit of an intuition about you know, what levels of precision you should expect to be able to gather at your scale, right? You know, it's gonna de depend differently on, on how much traffic your website gets compared to, to other companies. Um, but play around with that, that uh, sample size calculator and, and, and it should give you some intuition in terms of how costly or how much data you'll need to get uh, very high levels of precision. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try and wrap this, I think maybe three or four more slides. So I'm gonna try and wrap up in five, 10 minutes um, uh, to get to the, the simulation exercise. But there's a couple of kind of key um, points I wanna, uh, emphasize about these, these decision-making paradigms that I've been talking about, right? So uh, one is that these classical notions of significance, the, the notions that this 5% rule is based on um, are really designed to do one thing, which is to control your false positive rate, right? And so a false positive is merely a situation where you conclude that there's truly a difference between versions A and B, when in reality, there is no difference or that the difference is negligible, right? So a 5% significance level, which is the kind of the common scientific threshold that a lot of people use for deciding whether a result is significant, means that uh, uh, essentially 5% of the time, you're gonna conclude that there's an effect there when there really is not an effect. Now, this is valuable when precision is important, right? Controlling false positive rates can matter a lot, right? Uh, especially in fundamental science, right? If you're a physicist and you're trying to detect whether some particle exists, uh, concluding some new particle exists when really there's no particle there is, is very costly, right? Nobody wants to, to um, make that kind of mistake. Um, and so it's very important to be very precise when, when you're making scientific measurements about some, some scientific theory. But the fact of the matter is that I contend this isn't really the main thing most people are caring about when they're making uh, decisions for businesses. Um, and so, so it can be dangerous to just adopt what has been this historical legacy statistical framework when it comes to uh, business decisions in the online environment, right? And, and, and one way you can think about this is the fact that in a lot of situations, false positives in uh, A-B testing are really not costly at all, right? So by the time you de de uh, have a hypothesis to test, by the time you've developed two different versions of your website, um, 
if there's really no difference between the two versions of your website, what that means is that it, there's no cost in making the quote unquote wrong decision. There's no cost in saying there was an effect there when the, really there was no effect um, in terms of the effect, the impact on your conversion rates. Uh, to, to say that there's no difference means that they have the exact same conversion rates. So there's not a, a big cost in making the wrong decision right there. Um, now, uh, yeah, so, so in this situation, I think precision is much less important. And in, 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 in these situations, adopting the metric optimization paradigm can be much more useful, right? And in, the, in this paradigm, smaller samples with much less significance can actually be okay. Um, so again, just to kind of summarize the difference between these two paradigms, in the hypothesis testing paradigm, you can think of that as like a precision mindset where precision matters a lot. It's very important to make sure you're making the right decision in all scenarios. False positives are costly. And in the metric optimization paradigm, or what I, you can think of as a risk mindset, precision is like, a, it's a nice to have. It would be nice to be able to precisely quantify the difference between uh, the treatments that you're experimenting with. But really the main thing you care about is maximizing your profits over a fixed period of time, right? And, and in this case, uh, false positives can, can be much less costly than they are in other uh, scientific paradigms. So there's a question on multi-arm bandit testing um, which, which I, which I will, uh, get to, uh, at, at the end of, um, end of the, the seminar, I'll touch on some themes around multi-armed bandits. So, so, uh, okay. So, so assuming I've convinced you that met the metric optimization paradigm is the proper paradigm for thinking about, uh, business experiments, there's a couple of insights I want to, I want to highlight. So one, Essentially, this should be a very intuitive thing, and and uh, you know it's it's not necessarily revolutionary for me to say this, but it, this is something which is very underemphasized when it comes to using statistics uh, uh, in a lot of A/B testing platforms. Right, this gets obscured by conversations about p-values and hypothesis testing, and 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 really, uh, the the main insight here is that if there's a big difference between versions A and B, if there's a really big difference in the conversion rates between uh, one version of your website and the other version, it's going to be obvious to detect that difference, right? So when you have large effect sizes, when there's truly meaningful differences between your two variations, you, you don't need millions of observations to detect those differences, right? So large differences can be detectable with smaller sample sizes. Similarly, if there's truly a small difference between, uh, if, if, if there's a small difference between variations A and B, it's really not that costly to get the, you know, let's say variation B has a slightly higher conversion rate than variation A. Um, it's not that costly because the, the uh, conversion, the, the difference is small. It's not a big deal if you, if you make a mistake there and implement variation A instead of variation B, right? And so you can think about running scenarios like this where you let your experiment run for a reasonable amount of time that fits with the pace of your marketing life cycle. Um, and if you don't detect an effect, you just conclude that it's not big enough to stress about um, in, in, in your context, right? So if you can't detect an effect after, let's say, running an experiment for one month, there might be an effect there, right? There's probably some differences between the versions, but if it wasn't detectable within uh, you know, a reasonable period of time, you can safely conclude that it's a, a small effect, right? Because if it were a big effect, you would have observed that difference within uh, uh, with much less data, right? So kind of the key insight here is that with smaller samples, you're not going to get every decision correct, but that's okay because you will get the big ones correct, right? So it's, uh, it's easy to detect big effect sizes and therefore you can kind of it's okay if you get the kind of the smaller effect, the, the smaller, uh, the experiments with smaller effects wrong, or you might, you might make some wrong decisions in that case, as long as you get the, the big decisions correct, right? The, the situations where there's truly a huge difference between the, uh, the variations. Okay, so a, a related point, which I'm calling key insight number two uh, within this optimization framework is that the A-B test results uh, essentially follow what's you know, known as the Pareto principle, right? And this is that 80% of the gains you can observe 
from experimentation are going to come from 20% of the experiments that you run. All right, so this is a distribution of effect size that I've uh, measured in, in my data set of uh, close to 3,000 A-B tests. And what I find is that nearly 50% of all experiments move the conversion rate on the website by less than one-tenth of 1%. One um, and so what that means is that many of the experiments that you're going to be running, the effect sizes are going to be small. Um, uh, but there's going to be a small subset of experiments with very large effect sizes, right? And so, so kind of the key insight here is that getting the most out of A-B testing consists of finding those few big wins rather than expecting little wins from every single experiment that you run, right? And so you should think about this more, you should think about A-B testing more of like a soccer game than a basketball game, right? Where you might, in a soccer game, you might take 30 shots on goal and you might only make one, but that's all it takes to win the game, right? And it's the same thing with A-B testing. You might run 30 experiments and, and 29 of them might have very small effects. But if you find that one experiment with a huge effect size, um, that, that's enough to kind of outweigh all of the, um, uh, any mistakes you might've made in these with the smaller effects. Um, so uh, kind of combining these two insights into one very big picture takeaway, which, which is kind of the, the main thing I'm, I'm trying to drive home with these examples is that in A-B testing in, in the optimization paradigm, you're gonna get more value by running, running more experiments with smaller sample sizes compared to running fewer experiments with large sample sizes, um, right? And, and, and this is actually, uh, this insight is, is something I've internalized uh, through my own research, as well as the research of uh, a couple of Wharton professors, uh, you know, just recently, one is by Ron Berman in the marketing department, and others by Edward Azevedo in the applied economics department. Essentially, they have two uh, complementary uh, academic papers, which cover a lot of the kind of technical details and the mathematics and statistics and, and kind of the Bayesian uh, paradigm for, for justifying this key insight that I'm, that I'm mentioning here, which is that you really, it's okay to actually lower your standards for precision. Um, and, and so long as you're running more experiments uh, with the smaller sample sizes, right? So, so there's a lot more value. If you have a, you know, if you have a month's period of time, it's a lot more value in, in say running four experiments uh, for one week each, as opposed to running one experiment for the whole month. Um, and, and that's because Again, you, could, you should think of uh, kind of the paradigm of, of A-B testing, right? The way you win at A-B testing is by finding the needle in the haystack, right? Getting that one, that one result with a really big effect size and, and kind of resigning yourself and accepting the fact that you might get some of the smaller effect sizes. Uh, you might not be able to detect some of the smaller effect sizes. Okay, so uh, that brings me to the simulation exercise. and. Uh, I actually, this is, experience is kind of designed to encourage you to kind of implement some of these insights that I've, I've been covering. Um, and also to, for those of you who have never run an experiment, the, the simulation is also designed to help you understand kind of the look and feel of what it feels like to run an experiment in, in uh, an e-commerce website. Okay, so uh, basically what I've, I've spent the past year um, helping design this interactive tool, which is designed to give you this hands-on experience of e-commerce A-B testing. Um, and I'll mention that we are, you know, it's kind of under active development. We're making continuous improvements. So if you have, you know, uh, strong opinions or, or thoughts on, on the ways it can be improved, please reach out to me uh, after the seminar and, and give me your input. Okay, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, is give you a brief demo of how this works. Uh, and then I'm going to go over, there's going to be, a couple of the, the remaining time is going to be broken into a couple of different stages, right? So the first stage is what I'm calling a practice mode, where what I'm going to do is I'm going to break you out into small groups, uh, rooms of, let's say, five or six people. And the way you sh what you should do is, in, in this first time, uh, this first stage is to kind of familiarize, up, familiarize yourself with the interface, uh, kind of take the steps that I'm going to walk you through in, in my demo, as well as to discuss... Uh, some strategies with your group for kind of 
uh, maximizing your score on the simulation. Then I'm going to reconvene and, and go back into what's what I'm calling a competition mode where you guys will compete against each other kind of in the same simulated world. And hopefully at the end of this, we can take a few minutes and have some of the highest scoring teams kind of describe in their own words, the strategies that they were taking uh, for scoring highest on this simulation. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me actually, before I break you out into rooms, I'm going to um, give you a quick demo. Can everybody see this nano phone screen, hopefully? Yes, that's what it seems shows up on my Zoom. Okay, so essentially what we have here is uh, uh, a simulated scenario where uh, on the left-hand side, there's this website which you're in charge of managing, right? So, so um, I'm gonna click this scenario tab here, which is gonna describe uh, the, the scenario that I'm, I'm placing you guys in for this simulation. So you're the director of an e-commerce company called Nanophone. Um, your digital marketing team has asked you to come up with a list of enhancements for your product page. And they've identified five possible elements on your website uh, worth uh, experimenting on, right? So these five elements are represented by these five uh, buttons, light bulbs on the left-hand side. And you can hover over each one uh, and, and kind of get a sense for what it is that you're manipulating in the experiment. And, and now really the, the goal here, what you're gonna have is a period of 12 simulated weeks where over this time, the goal is to maximize the profits over the course of the 12 weeks, right? So um, I don't think it's giving away too much to say that you're in the, the metric optimization paradigm. Um, and you should think about strategies for um, maximizing your profits over this, this fixed period of time. Uh, and, and, and so the, the way you do this is by running experiments and then implementing the results of those experiments uh, over the 12-week the period. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through, uh, there's also this FAQ uh, bar, which you can um, expand once, when I give you some time to kind of play with the simulation. Uh, but I'm going to kind of walk you through what it feels like to run an experiment and how you move through the simulation. Okay, so you click OK, got it. You can And you can always come back to that help screen if you click this help button here. Uh, if you, if you want to read these, these um, things at any point throughout the simulation. Okay, so uh, the main thing that you're going to be doing, uh, it's, it's not super obvious, but, but uh, the, the first step that you want to take when you start the simulation is to, uh, the main actions you can take is to start an experiment. And the way you start an experiment is by hovering over one of these five elements on the left-hand side and uh, clicking it and then clicking new experiment, okay? And what that's gonna do is it's gonna bring up this experiment pane on the right-hand side where uh, there's a couple of different options. Um, one is this targeting condition option and, and for now, I'm going to leave it as is. I'm going to come back to it in, in, in the, the second week and describe a little bit more about how you can use that. Uh, and and this, the, the second option you can do is you can change how much traffic you send to each of the different uh, variants that you're going to be testing, right? So in this case, I'm testing uh, three different variants of this image. There's a gold image, a black image, and a pink image. And you can see those by clicking the, the element and uh, clicking this drop down, you can see this is what the black image looks like. This is what the pink one looks like. Um, and so we're going to go back to the gold. And, and, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run an experiment where we send, you know, 33% of the traffic that arrives at our website to receive each of these different variations. So when you start an experiment, um, I, you know, I don't have any reason to send traffic to more, one version versus the other. So I'm just gonna leave the traffic allocation kind of at its default, which is equal allocation. I'm gonna hit save. And I'm gonna run uh, the experiment for this first week, okay? So I'm gonna hit run week one experiments. This tells you kind of a quick summary view. Make sure you wanna confirm the experiments that you're running. You click run. Uh, this, this first uh, run might take a little bit of time for the server to boot up. Our server is adaptive. So the more you guys use it, the faster it will get. But you know, because nobody's used it in a few minutes, this, this first one will take a few seconds. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, the results of the first experiment have been uh, brought back, reported back to me. I'm now on week two. And if you see that the uh, experiment that we were just running, there's now a results uh, uh, section here where I've simulated, what's happened is, is over the intervening week or the simulated week, I've, I've simulated uh, the arrival of approximately 5,000 customers arriving at the website, being allocated to these different variations, you know, seeing different colors of this image um, and recording their behavior uh, whether they made a purchase or not. And, and there's, you know, some, some statistical simulations under the hood that are kind of driving these effects. Now, uh, you can look at the data here and it, and it looks like from what I can see, there's not a lot of reasons to, you know, th there's not a lot of evidence to prefer one variation over the other. So I'm actually going to run this experiment for one more week. And at the same time, uh, I'm going to highlight the fact that you can run multiple experiments on multiple things at the same time. So I'm running this image experiment. I can also run an experiment on this call to action button. So I click the button, click add uh, new experiment. This button contains four different variants. And again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't have any reason to prefer one over the other. So I'm gonna hit save. I'm gonna run week two. Now I'm running two experiments simultaneously. Okay, so. <clears throat> Um, coming back to the, now we're in the third week, right? So I've run two weeks of experiments. Um, my image experiment, uh, has gathered more data, right? So there's more sessions that have been measured, uh, in, in this first experiment. It still doesn't seem like there's a super strong difference between the two variations or the three variations. Um, but one thing you can do, let's say I, you know, at this point, I wanted to conclude that this B ver version uh, has a smaller conversion rate than the other two variations. One thing you can do, if you go back into this traffic settings menu, you can change how much traffic you allocate between the, the different variations, right? So uh, because I kind of, I'm hypothesizing that the B variation has a lower conversion rate, I'm gonna kind of hedge my bet a little bit and, and reduce the amount of traffic going to that version um, and, and kind of increase the traffic going to the, the other two variations, okay? Um, similarly for uh, this experiment, for, for the call to action experiment I was running, uh, there's not a super strong difference between the, the variations, but it does seem like the D variation has a slightly higher conversion rate than the other versions. So one thing I can do, let's say I wanted to allocate uh, 60, uh, let's say 70% of my traffic to that one and 10% of my traffic to the other three variations. And what this is gonna do is it's just gonna send more of our traffic to that, um, that what I am hypothesizing to be the higher performing variation. Okay, so, so essentially what you can do over time, you're gonna, you're gonna run experiments. You're going to change the traffic allocation across the different uh, uh, experiments. And again, the goal is to um, allocate as much traffic as possible to the highest performing variations. And kind of the key decision variable here is like, when do you conclude that you have enough evidence to, um, uh, to say that you can confidently conclude one of the variations as one. And so that's one of the things I want you guys to kind of experiment with um, and then play around with as, as you're going through the, the simulation. Uh, so one thing I wanna show you, uh, one thing you can do, let's say I wanted to run one more experiment on this, this uh, component down here, this text variation. When you're running an experiment, you can, you can experiment on all the customers at the same time, but you can also experiment separately on different subsections of your customers, right? So there's these four different groups that your customers are allocated in, depending on their location and the, the uh, device that they're using to uh, uh, visit your website. And let's say I wanted to just experiment on people in the US based off of some assumption or some hunch I might have that 
people in the US might prefer a different uh, text to people uh, outside of the US. So you can edit the name of this experiment. I'm gonna call it Features USA. I'm going to uh, save that experiment. And I can actually run another experiment on the other groups of users. So the international groups of users. So I'm gonna call this Features International. And what this allows me to do is uh, separate the, the results for the international users and the US users, um, assuming that, that I, I might want to target some subset of users to, to receive one version of my website and another set of users to re receive another version of my website. And this is to kind of encourage you to start thinking about how you can use uh, personalization in combination with experimentation to kind of increase uh, your profits. So more or less, the, uh, you repeat this process, um, testing on, on various elements, uh, looking at the results, interpreting them, changing your traffic allocation over time. And um, at the end of the 12 week period, uh, you'll see over time, what, what happens every week is your, your profits are accumulating over time. And at the end of 12 weeks, you will land on this uh, results page where I tell you uh, uh, a kind of a, a simulated score. In this case, I, I got a 73%. And you should think about something around like 70 to 80% as being a, a pretty good score. 100% would be the score you get if you had perfect information. And about 50% is the score you would get if you were just randomly uh, allocating users to the variations in, on the website. Um, and, and the goal here is to really bump up this, this percentage score as much as possible by experimenting, allocating users to the, the, the best variations and um, uh, deciding the optimal timing to make that transition from experimenting to kind of uh, sending all of your traffic to um, one of the different variations. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to give you guys the link to this. Um, and if you have questions, I'm going to be popping in the, the breakout rooms. Um, but, but one thing I want you guys to do is kind of rely on each other. Like if something is confusing in these small groups, um, I, I, you know, I encourage you to kind of pipe up and, and ask other people, you know, how they're thinking about this problem strategies that they're thinking about for, uh, maximizing profits. And what we're going to do is uh, in the competition mode, I want essentially one person from every group is going to be playing the competition and uh, kind of representing your group. And um, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about exactly how that works when, when we come back from this practice mode. But I'm going to take the next 15 minutes or so, we'll send you guys into breakout rooms, let you log into this simulation and play around with it yourself and see how, um, if you can develop an intuition or, or think about different ways of uh, using your experimentation uh, to maximize your, your total profits over the course of the 12 week simulated period. So I'm gonna drop a link in the, the Zoom chat. And the way that you're gonna log in is the email you used to uh, register at the conference and the password for everybody is just analytics, all lowercase. And your email should be all lowercase as well. Um, so before, I'm gonna send everybody into great breakout rooms now, but um, before you join the room, make sure you Visit that link and log in. Make sure that you're you're successfully logged in. If you have troubles, hang back in this main room, and I'll try and troubleshoot while you're uh, uh, before sending you into the breakout room. Uh, but once you've logged in and you land on a screen that looks like this, um, feel free to join your breakout room and um, uh, start playing around with the with the uh, simulation. And um, yeah, you can raise your hand in the breakout room if you have questions and, and I'll, I'll try and kind of drop in and, and help you guys out. Okay, so 
let me do the Zoom breakout rooms. I think we're gonna go about seven rooms. So there should be about six to seven people in each room. I'm gonna open the rooms and you guys should receive a pop-up to join the, the room. Uh, now, if, if you've logged in and, and everything works with the simulation, go ahead and join the room. If you're having trouble, hang back and, and um, I'll, I'll try and help you guys out. Make sure we can get this simulation working for you. And this is going to be, I say, 15 minutes of practice mode. And then I'm going to bring you back and then we're going to do a, a quick competition mode. Okay, let me see if I can help Crystal here. Okay. Let me So I'm responding to those of you who are having trouble I'm responding to you directly in the chat. So let me know if if this works. Okay, it seems like most people are in the rooms. Um, if you're still having trouble, let me know. <clears throat> I didn't realize my lighting got so moody in here. <laughs> <clears throat>
Okay. I think most people are set. Okay. I'm going to try and broadcast a message here. It's like just for non Wharton people. They're not. It's fine. If that's, if that's the result yeah. of they just walked away or. So it's, it's, it's perfectly okay if people don't want to participate. No, no, no compulsory participation here. So. I'm going to hop into one of the, the rooms real quick.
Okay, I think everyone's back in the main room here. Um, one thing I, I uh, what we're gonna do now, I, so I, I apologize for, for rushing this a little bit. Um, I wanna make sure we, we get to this, this uh, kind of competition mode and, and kind of the, the idea with this competition mode is that one person from your group uh, it's kind of kind of represent your group and, and play the game. So so when I send you back in your breakout rooms, I encourage that person to share their screen and and, and you guys can collaborate. Um, but that one person is kind of going to implement the actions of your group's uh, decisions. What we're going to be doing is essentially everybody is going to be now playing the same version of the simulation up until this point. Everyone's you know uh, would would have been playing like random versions of the simulation where like the pink phone might have been. Uh, the best for some people and the green phone might have been best for others. In this next version, everyone's going to be playing the same world. And uh, the goal is I'm hoping you can implement some of the principles I talked about earlier. And, and then you're, you're going to be able to play this game once. It's going to be a 12-week walkthrough. And uh, at the end, I'm hoping, uh, you know, I can kind of ask some of the, the higher perform highest performing teams to kind of describe your strategy and, and, and um, talk about how you you maximized your score um, in, in your case. So I'm going to send you back into your breakout rooms. But before I do, uh, I want you to click on this link I'm going to send in the chat here. Or, you know, the, the main person, the whoever is going to be playing the, the simulation for your team should, should uh, take note of this link. It's just the same link slash WCA 2021. Um, and that's the link that you need to click on to play the kind of shared uh, uh, competition mode that we're going to be looking at here. Okay, so I'm going to send you back. I'm going to give you 12 minutes to play the game. So, so you know, if it, if it comes down to two minutes left, I'll give you a warning. Try and just kind of run through the simulations without changing your decisions too much more. Just keep, keep clicking run, you know, run weak um, until you get to the end of the simulation. Um, and then we'll see if, um, uh, yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll bring you back here and we'll kind of compare results and, and do a little bit of a debrief if, if that works for everybody. So, okay, I'll send you back into your rooms. Uh, make sure you take note of that link in the chat. That's the, that's the link where you now want to play uh, the competition mode and, and I'll bring you back in about 12 minutes. I think you can go ahead and join your breakout room.
hello, Alex. Can you hear me? Oh, I can't hear you. Okay, I can hear you. Sorry. Oh, I hi. Um, I was assigned to join room four, but it just keeps spinning. I can't seem to join. So I logged off and joined again. Is there any way you can um, put me into the room again? Yes, let me, let me try that. Thanks Thank you. Something. Does that work? Here we go. Look at that, we got everybody into the breakout rooms. <laughs>
Okay, so I think we're back. I, I apologize for, uh, I can see, I saw some of you guys were, were definitely rushing at the end. Um, so I, I appreciate you rushing to the finish line. Um, so it looks like bragging rights go to the group with uh, Rachel Merriman. Um, I'm wondering if Rachel wouldn't mind uh, unmuting and, and describing in a few words her your your team's strategy and and how you think you you ended up on top. Um, sure. So we basically took an approach of experimenting on every feature and optimizing early. So from week one, we started experiments. Um, on all five features. And after week one, we immediately started shifting our traffic allocation into the feature that seemed to be performing best. Um, and we sort of like redid our um, allocations every week for the first few weeks, I think like weeks one to four or five. And then after that, we just like put all of our eggs in the basket that seemed to be performing the best and did like, you know, 98% to that one and then like 1% to the other features um, and then just ran the rest of our experiments that way. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so so um, I that that is an excellent strategy. It, uh, it's more or less the, the, the implementation of the principles I was describing earlier uh, in the first part of this the, the seminar. And um, one thing I want to show you guys is uh, if you look at this, the slides on the screen now, what I have is, is um, essentially comparison between a couple of different approaches. So in the, in the red bars, I'm just ignoring any of the kind of personalization aspect, right? I'm not treating people in the US different from the international or people on mobile different from the desktop. Um, and in the blue bars, I am accounting for and trying to uh, optimize along those dimensions. Uh, but the different groups that I have here, on the left-hand side, I just have a random strategy, which this is kind of the average score of these different strategies across a large number of simulations. And if you look at the, the, middle, col the middle column, the, what I have is a strategy where I do more or less what Rachel just described. I experiment on every feature simultaneously for the first two weeks. And then no matter what statistical significance is, how much data I have, you allocate all the traffic at the end of that two weeks towards the variance with the highest performing uh, conversion rate along each of the dimensions for the remaining 10 weeks, right? So this is, uh, you can think of it as what's called an explore first or an epsilon first strategy. Uh, when it, it's, it's an approach of solving, if you've heard of the multi-arm bandit problem, it's a, it's a very simple heuristic for solving this problem. And one of the main takeaways I want to uh, share with you guys, and this is uh, a subject of, of another research project I'm, I'm working on, which is that that simple strategy, which I just described, which is explore, do a couple, do a lot of experimentation early on, and then implement the results for the remaining of, of the time period, gets you a, very close to kind of what could be considered state-of-the-art, dynamic, AI-based, multi-armed bandit strategies. Um, and this is true for both the personalized and the non-personalized version. Um, so really uh, most of the gains from uh, really sophisticated and fancy AI strategies, which are optimizing like dynamically over time um, can be achieved with these really simple strategies uh, based off of this principle of gathering data and making your decisions early on and implementing your decisions kind of independent of statistical significance, right? And so that's kind of the, the main uh, takeaway that I, that I, I want to emphasize. And you guys are welcome to continue playing the simulation throughout uh, the next day or so. You, your logins should still work. So feel free, if you felt like you didn't get enough time and, and you want to improve your score, continue to play uh, the simulation uh, just at the, the base URL that I shared first. Um, but I, uh, and I know we're, we're just over time by a couple of minutes, but let me summarize what uh, kind of the mi big picture takeaways, the points that I want you guys to, to take home um, in the next 60 seconds. So if you go back to the, the very 
first part of my session where I was describing how to interpret PV, P values, I was saying that, you know, if you really want confidence, you need much smaller P values. And that might kind of contradict what I'm, what I'm saying in the second half of this talk, which is to kind of ignore your P values. And really what it comes down to is this, is, which is that if you really want precision, you do need much smaller P values and much larger sample sizes than you think. But kind of the, the big picture takeaway that I want you to internalize is that precision is really not the right metric to kind of prioritize when it comes to making business decisions um, uh, over time. And uh, so really, if you care about metric optimization, which is you care about maximizing your profits over a fixed period of time, you should be comfortable adopting more of a risk mindset and lowering your standards for precision. And you should run many experiments more quickly, make your decisions early on, and recognize that most of your gains are gonna come from finding the few experiments uh, in the all of the experiments that you might be running, which are gonna have the largest possible effect sizes, right? So uh, precision is not the main goal. Um, really kind of making decisions early and using experimentation and A-B testing as a tool for gathering that data and just making an informed, not super precise, but a data informed decision is really uh, a very powerful technique for using A-B testing and, and kind of changing the way you think about statistics uh, and statistical significance when it comes to randomized experiments. So I'm going to stop there. I'm Happy to hang around if anyone wants to chat one on one or, or you know, if, if other people hang around. I'll be here for a few minutes. I very much appreciate your guys' patience, your participation. Um,